This is Guernsey, part of a group of small islands that played a huge part in history. The Channel Islands were the only British territory to be occupied by Nazi Germany during World War II and transformed into a concrete fortress. Hundreds of reinforced bunkers, gun emplacements and forts were built and miles of tunnels were excavated. In total, an immense 8% of the entire Atlantic Wall's concrete was poured into the islands, making the small island of Guernsey the most fortified place in the world. Islanders lived under German rule for five years of their lives. I went to school under German rule. I left school under German rule. Enduring hunger. The shortage of food was a great problem. People were dying. And surviving together. We survived. And we survived as a family. This is their story. So you remained here during the occupation? Yes, with my parents. We had intended to um, leave. My mother was going to take me to London to my um, father's brother for safety. But um, unfortunately, I fell over. And my mother didn't want to leave my father. And so we said we'd get the next boat. And the next boat never came. <laughs> In 1940, when evacuation come, I was laid up in bed with a child um, ailment, either German measles or mumps or something like that. So I was in quarantine for three weeks. So that's why I never evacuated, because I couldn't go. We were due to be evacuated. Uh, my dad was a grower, Guernsey tomato grower. And the mum and dad decided that dad would stay and look after the property. And my mother would take my sister and I, my younger sister and I, Peggy, uh, to the mainland because they thought it was only going to be for a short time. So we, we went to the main road, waited for the boss and the boss never came. Waited and waited no boss. So the words my mother said to me, and they've stayed with me all my life. She said to the two of us, when we're going home, children will sink or we'll swim together. On June 28th, 1940, two days before the Germans occupied Guernsey, three German planes bombed the St. Peterport Harbour, killing 34 islanders in the raids. They mistook all the tomato lorries with all the piles of the chip baskets on it for ammunition and this is why so many people got killed because they shot it up. The night that the harbour was bombed I was to my grandmother. My grandmother told my uncle to take us back home to our own place and then he went off, took his car, he said I'm, I'm going to see what damage there is at the White, there is at the White Rock and uh, what he saw it uh, he was not never the same man after that. Yes, I was coming out of junior school and the planes were coming over a part of the island, the western part of the island, and they had bombed the harbour and they were coming over to the west to turn around. But we saw these planes come over with the black cross underneath the wings and uh, we were picking up little twigs and that and we were making into a cross and we were going Ooh, you know like this like kids do and little did we know what had actually happened and what was about to happen and we heard about a gentleman uh, from our neighborhood that had been killed you know uh, he went under his lorry and uh, obviously uh, he didn't survive. As the Germans made themselves at home on Guernsey, many had to live with the enemy. We had the German meteorologist billeted on us and um, you either accepted it or you, you moved out and where will you go? Uh, otherwise, the German um, officer would come in and give you maybe two hours to get your things together and get out and leave everything. Um, which you had no choice, you had to go, that was it. 
we had a knock on our front door and it was a high ranking officer and we found out later that his name was Louis Horst and he came with his valet and they wanted to look round the house and it was a bungalow and obviously there was mum and dad and two children, a boy and a girl. So he came round and had a look and he said, I will take that bedroom, which was my mum and dad's bedroom. So mum and dad had to go in my bedroom and Peggy and I were sharing uh, the third bedroom, which was only really a single bedroom. But uh, yes, he stayed with us the whole of the occupation. Well, he was part of our house for so long, as you can imagine, a Nazi, an absolute Nazi, one of the few that we had over here. You know, they were really quite kind and good, the soldiers. They were good to us school children. Coming home from the school and that, they were very pleasant. And the ones that came to the house, uh, my mother used to take in washing to try and earn a few German marks. And uh, they were very good to us. And if they could bring a little piece of bread or something, they did. So, you know, uh, in general, the soldiers, well, they behaved well and they were well disciplined. The Germans weren't all totally bad, not uh, to the point where they were aggressive to children and everything like that, unless the children were doing anything wrong. And on one occasion I was walking along from Summary Road and Fort Road and I was passing one of the houses where the Germans had taken um, uh, control of it and an Allies plane came over and I was holding my bike and, and the German officer rushed out, grabbed me, took me back into the house and kept me there until the plane had gone. So um, that was a, an act of sort of kindness. Goodwill aside, in September 1940, communications were cut and all wireless sets were confiscated, leaving islanders to their own devices. You could make crystal sets and they were manufactured in Guernsey by different people with the know-how. It consisted of getting a pair of earphones, which is the most important thing, and that was quite, quite difficult. Uh, the telephone boxes and other things were raided for those sort of things. Um, then on the actual crystal set, you've got quite a complicated thing. The most important thing is down here, the crystal, and there was a little wire that you could adjust and you actually could pick up the tune from the crystal. It's all coiled up and it gave a vague impression. Very ingenious. When I went left school and went to a builder, unknown to me at the time, I saw this being made, being fixed up. And when this man came home, I said to him, he said, do you know what this is? I said, any fool knows what that is, that's a light fitting. He said, no, 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 he said, not a light fitting. I said, it is a light fitting. I said, any fool knows that. He said, no, 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 he said, it's a radio. Yeah, that's a radio. Crystal set, they call them. I said to the, the man, I said, how much is that? He said, no, that's one German mark. I said, I said, I got my money. I said, I'll have that. My mother said, you're not having that, she says. That's illegal. I said, yeah. I said, I've got, I got one. I've got a mark. I said, I'll give it. So I, I had it and I kept it. Some even had help from an unlikely ally. His name was Rudy Schmidt. And it, it was a wonderful friendship with a German soldier that became a great friend. He made my mum and dad a crystal set. We used to listen to the news and when the, the king was making his speech, which were wonderful speeches, we used to listen. It was so moving, you know, to, to be able to listen what was going on. However, there were still tough times ahead as hunger crept through the island. The British government's plan to starve out the garrison and make them surrender became a long and drawn out process. 
By 1944, St Malo was the last trading port for the Channel Islands, so following D-Day when the city was left in ruins, all trade links to France were severed, leaving the island in a siege period. My mother had been known to go into the market and queue for an hour or so and get there and there was nothing left and she'd come home in tears. But we were fortunate that we lived in the country because my father managed to grow a few vegetables and um, he had grown some onions and had strung them to dry in the greenhouse and they went, they just disappeared. The hardest part was towards the end when we had very little food. We were fortunate because my father was, as I said before, was a grower and he was growing crops for the GUB, the Guernsey Utilisation Board. And those crops went to the Germans and for a time the Germans allocated half of the oil and produce uh, to the Hollanders. But when it came towards the end, they kept everything to themselves. And uh, but my dad was fortunate that he was growing crops for them and he used to go at night and uh, he used to poke around in the soil, get some potatoes out then put the soil back together uh, so no one would notice. Of course the shortage of food was a great problem. People were dying at the end and this is how the Vega came into Guernsey. The Red Cross ship arrived in December 1944 carrying life-saving food parcels for the islanders. Well, this is an example of one of the Red Cross parcels which we received at the end of 1944. Everyone had a parcel, one of these parcels, and it would last, basically, it was supposed to last a month for each person. Without those parcels, Guernsey would have starved. Um, it was a very liberating occasion there was various contents. They varied from tin foods, uh, chocolate, tobacco, all sorts of things as you can see in the case, whole milk, powdered milk, but really it made the difference between life and death. We had to go and collect them at the depots. So we went, uh, us, we went with our little horse we had in cart, because you had one for every person in the family. So we collected for ourselves and our neighbours and, and for our uncles and aunts. We had to go to the depot, had a, a cartload of, of Red Cross parcels and then delivered so many on the way home. The islands were left stranded and largely ignored by the British government. But convinced that Churchill would decide to fight to get the islands back, Hitler heavily armoured the coasts. Guernsey held more guns than the neighbouring 600 miles of Normandy coastline, making it an impenetrable fortress. However, in spite of Hitler's efforts to secure the islands, there was never the chance to utilise them to their full potential. Ultimately, the occupying Germans were left awaiting a battle that never came and eventually surrendered the Channel Islands upon the HMS Bulldog on May the 9th, 1945. The combined forces had uh, occupied France, so we knew that very shortly, you know, they would liberate us. And uh, we were told that on our crystal sets that uh, Mr. Churchill would give a speech on May the 8th, 1945. One minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday the 8th of May. But in the interest of saving lives, the ceasefire began yesterday to be sounded all along the front and uh, our dear Channel Islands are also to be freed today. The window was flung open, the bunting was brought out where it had been hidden all those years. There was tears and tears you cannot imagine. It was the most exciting time. Everybody went to town, you know? So we, at home, we harnessed up the horse with a wagonette and my family and, and, our, lo and our tenants all went to town together. There must have been about 30 of us on the trailer and the, 
the tractor chugged along, uh, all along the way to town. When we got to the bottom of the Rohays, we met our first British Tommy. And we, the tractor stopped and he was throwing cigarettes for the men and sweets and chocolate for us. And oh, it was amazing. mother had made me a, a red, white and blue dress out of the bunting that she had hidden away. <laughs> I was so pleased with this lovely little dress that I had on. We went to town and it was packed with people and the um, uh, liberating forces were coming ashore and throwing sweets into the crowd and everybody was happy and clapping and really, really joyful. It was a fantastic time because five years under occupation is a long time. I was very fortunate. I was brought up in a good family and being so close-knit and with an enemy all around us and feeling always felt secure. It's a very important part of our history. We celebrate liberation, but we need to remember why we celebrate liberation. It was because of the oppressed period of the occupation. And it needs all these things to be there for not visitors so much as tomorrow's children and students and historians. It's very important for the future heritage of the island. This beautiful island has such a rich history, which is vividly remembered by those who lived it and by those who we have had memories from. The troubles in Dorblin no doubt continue to be recognised as Guernsey remains a living museum for the German occupation, leaving behind its legacy of concrete. <laughs>